Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about the daunting challenges that we have in the textile industry. The textile supply chain as we know it. And from background, I'm a biotechnologist. Uh, just joined the textile industry. And of course, you, uh, you have the advantage of sometimes looking with a kind of bright look to uh, what we're doing. Let me just ask a question first. Um, who has children here? Who's concerned about the world that they are going to grow up in? Well, I think when we talk about change, you talk about the why of change, the what, the how, and the who. And the why of change is, of course, we cannot continue to deplete our world and use resources as inefficient as we do. Currently, also the textile industry, basically if you look to publications in the last 10 years, we have not necessarily always been in the news in a positive way. Whether it's about labor practices, about chemical pollutants, uh, clearly as an industry, as a supply chain, we probably do not do yet as well as many others. That's also why we are so excited, and I sit here with my colleagues of other responsible chemical companies, about the new tool that BlueSign will launch. Every progress comes from science, comes from uh, ethics, integrity, if you like, but above all, nowadays, about open innovation, sharing data, uh, in information technology, it's about open source. With us, it's about making our data widely available. And sustainability and traceability are the key issues for us to address. Now, sustainability is a very close to heart. 26 years ago, when I started as a young scientist with Unilever, started uh, investigating detergents, I had Dr. Ganguly as my mentor, and he said, Sander, it's very simple, you have to focus on one thing. It is not sustainable in the next 25 years to use 25 liters of water, to use a couple of grams of detergents, to take out a picogram of dirt and some bad smell out of five kilogram of clothing. And that's what we focused on. And we were probably not as efficient as Professor Pauli, but we, we made quite some uh, pro, uh, progress there. As a company, we're also very, very focused on uh, sustainability. And let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, our new dyeing range is based on natural waste, uh, so completely extracted from natural waste, uh, therewith uh, basically reducing the footprint. Um, we have in Pakistan, and again coming back to building communities, um, we have a facility. Pakistan is not necessarily the country with the strictest legislation with respect to water, but we have a facility that is zero discharge. This was built because this uh, facility was well rooted in the community, and as a consequence, the managing director was very much driven to build this clean uh, facility. Altogether, I think. It's important that we are sitting here to get together, supporting the launch of this tool that gives the industry, whether it's the wholesalers, whether it's the retailers, whether it's uh, the mills, the possibility to look into their processes and see whether they can be improved from a traceability as well as from a sustainability aspect. Yeah. With that, I would like to hand it over mm -hmm to my colleague, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Eric Hauptmann. I'm the uh, CEO of DICE. I'm very pleased to be here today, together with my colleagues, uh, to, um, of course, uh, join the uh, launch of the new tool, but also endorse this new tool. And personally, uh, I've mentioned yesterday to you, Peter, I see this hopefully as a new start uh, in, the, in the discussion 
between the, the, the key players uh, in the industry, the retailers, the textile mills, and the, the chemical producer, the dye stuff producers. Um, I think it's also the right time to, to uh, introduce this tool. And um, I've, I've been trying to think, you know, why do we sit here to talk about saving water or energy? I think you at home, you all do that by yourself. You know, we, every day we try to save energy, we try to save water. So why, why do we need to sit together here today? And if I would put, um, you know, one point today, why we're sitting here today, I would call it China. Um, I've spent 30 years in this industry, I've spent 20 years overseas, and out of these 20 years, 10 years in China. And I'm not sure if most of you know, but in the 80s, uh, Europe used to be the biggest manufacturer of textile, and at that time also the biggest consumer of textile. This hasn't changed on the consumer side, but today China is the biggest producer of textile. Let me give you two figures. When I arrived in 2000 in China, China was exporting $80 billion worth of textile <coughs> and garment. When I left 10 years later, China was exporting over $200 billion of textile and garments. I think last year, they were close to $300 billion. What is the result of this? What is the result of this? If you look at television, and everybody can see now in Europe, CCTV, you see a lot of reports on pollution in China. And if you look at what has happened over the last year, um, it was a matter of time when the government would step in. And those of you who go to China may have seen a change. I went back to China after five years in Europe. I went back to see China. I see a major change, a major change. The government that was put in place last year has decided to embark and try to make China a, a, a better country and has introduced drastic laws, drastic laws that have started beginning of the year that are impacting the textile industry, that are impacting our industry, the dye industry. And to be frank, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that, if you really look at it, the textile industry is starting to move again. And we see factories now going out of China. We see factories closing in China. Uh, where are they going? That's the big question. Yeah? And we see some factories going to Vietnam. We see factories, business going to Bangladesh. We start to see some business going to Africa. But where is the industry going to go? It's not sure, because it's not clear if the industry will accept, the countries will accept this industry, and the pollution it can and it has generated in China. Um, so if we look at uh, a potential alternative is maybe the industry will stay in China, but will improve, will get better. To be very frank, the technologies are available. The, the diastive industry, we three have tried to develop many new products, new technologies, together with the machinery manufacturer. Yeah, Bruckner is one, a tea stain. There, there are many companies that we work with to try to, to, to reduce the consumption of water. Was that used? Not really. Why? Because of costs. Cost, 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 cost. And that's why the industry in China uh, was so keen to take on the, 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 the textile industry. It was creating jobs, uh, but to be frank, were they taking care of waste? No. The big change we see today is that now in China, waste is starting to cost money. And just to give you an example, if you produce a raw material called H-acid, Maybe most of you don't know that, but H acid is a very big component for uh, dye stuffs that are called reactive dyes for cotton. If you produce one kilo of H acid, you produce 30 kilo of waste. If in Europe you have to pay for that waste, it costs you a lot of money. If in China you look beside the, the uh, fence and you see the Yangtze and you put the waste in the Yangtze, of course you have zero cost. That has to change, that is changing in China. That's what we're seeing right now, and we are quite happy. And I'm getting asked recently in, in many meetings with customers, um, you know, are the prices of dyes going to come down? Uh, they've been going up recently a little bit. Um, I would say to you, probably not because of that. 
because waste is costing money, because waste is, has got a big impact on our industry, uh, and it has to change. But it's good. It's good for the industry. It's good for sustainability. And that's why we need the tools that Blue Sign uh, is, is proposing, uh, because it will help us to define new technologies uh, to stay competitive, to have products that are competitive, uh, keep the cost by becoming more efficient. Um, so it's a message that I would like to give, but I hope that the uh, industry works better together to tackle these problems and understand that waste uh, has to be paid for, uh, and waste is a big uh, part of our, uh, let's say, industry um, and, and the future. Thank Eric, you very thank much. Thank you very much. And Paul, thank you. My name is Paul Hume. I'm the president of Huntsman Textile Effects. And it's, it's my first conference, and it's a real pleasure, and thank you for the invitation, Peter. Really just building on my, uh, my colleagues are saying here, you know, the big threat for the textile industry is not chemicals, um, particularly those companies like Aerosols who are using Blue Finder to manage, if you like, our chemical management. The big elephant in the room is water. And again, my colleagues and our guest speaker talked about uh, water. I had a meeting last week in Beijing with the Minister of Environment. We also met with the Chinese textile authority, Sintaik. And they identified, if you like, what the issue in China uh, for water. Water is, the world is running out of water. Water is becoming increasingly scarce and is increasingly expensive. And let me just give you some stats, uh, statistics from, from China. So China is the largest textile producer in the world. It is the third largest user of industrial water. And it's, it, with its large population, China has a very low per capita in terms of water resource and is facing a critical situation. As at today, the forecast from the government and study of work done on behalf of the government, China by 2030, 15 years from now, is expected to be short of 199 billion cubic meters of water, unless they do something now. 11 provinces are water poverty, and that includes Beijing and Shanghai. 2.3 million envir environmental refugees are expected to flee water stress by 2020. Over 300 million rural Chinese have no access to safe drinking water. Under the 90 million Chinese regularly drink polluted water, therefore leading to a higher mortality rate, particularly for young and for, for the old. 3.7 million people die each year from drinking polluted water. 4.05 million hectares of land are irrigated with polluted water. 73.8% of groundwater in eight of the regions is totally polluted. And 95.6% of China's electricity relies upon water. I find that those statistics very concerning and quite scary. So what's the Chinese government doing? Well, on the 2nd of April this year, they announced a new water pollution control plan. This plan is aimed at improving drinking water, promoting water savings, reducing pollutants. The plan will be supported by new legislation and the new 13 five-year plan, which is due uh, back end of this year, will also like, support the new water plan. The plan is clear. It identifies 10 industries which will be highly regulated, highly controlled in terms of water and pollutant. And the textile industry is one of those industries. So we are going to see significant change in China. I particularly like the comments that came from Puma, uh, the landmark environmental P&L, and it was a quote on behalf of uh, Paul uh, Sarate. He says, once we know and we are aware, we are responsible for our action or inaction. 
We can do something about it, or we can ignore it. Either way, we are still responsible. I think that's a very telling statement. So we in Huntsman, like my colleagues, we take our responsibilities very seriously. We continue to invest about 5% of our revenues in innovation, and the majority of that innovation is around sustainability. We have technology today that will help to reduce water consumption by 50%, energy by 40%, reduce CO2s. So the technology is here. But we need your support, the brands and retailers. We can't make it happen. We can bring you the solution. We can work with you as partners, but you need to engage. And going back to the guest speaker, we need to change the game in the textile industry. And we can do that. If we work together, we work with governments and collaboration, we can change the game. We've got technologies to reset the baseline. And I believe, and I think my colleagues believe, you know, that is our mission, that is our goal, that is our responsibility. So thank you very much. And again, pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the questions. Mm. Paul and um, colleagues, thank you very much. So we'll open it to questions now. Starting with press colleagues. Yes, please. Yeah, we'll wait for the microphone. Should be coming over. Thank you. Roland Seidel, Textile Plus. <clears throat> I agree with you uh, that China changes to make cleaner factories, and I know this very well. But, uh, and they shift the production, and the dirty track goes, for example, to uh, Bangladesh. And this I know very well. So how how we can change the, uh, the game in Bangladesh, in your opinion. Mm. Because a lot of garments we use in Europe is produced there, and there are a lot of brands as well. And, and if I could follow that up, if you stop it in Bangladesh, what about Myanmar, then you've got Ethiopia. How do you stop it just being shifted? Well, the, 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 there's always two ways uh, to, to stop it. Either the government uh, steps in, like in China, and you know, for the government, it's not that easy because the textile industry creates a lot of jobs. China, over 100 million people work in the textile industry, and they need jobs. The other possibility, and this was mentioned by, by Paul just now, is to have uh, an industry, us, you, that is educated, that, that doesn't allow this, this pollution, and that has the tools, blue sign, um, to check that the, the, the producers of the textiles are doing it in the, in the right way. And I go even further. We go even further. We say, also check that the chemicals that have been used are done in a proper way. If you use a product, let's say from a, an Asian supplier, manufacturer, and he puts his raw materials I just mentioned in the Yangtze or in any other river, uh, and you just don't know it, or you don't want to know it, then it won't help. So I think, I think you, we have to make a choice. If either we wait for the government to step in, or we as an industry take the lead. And I think we are for the, this lead. That's what we, we're trying to say, is we need to work closer with the retailer and don't take the textile mills into hijacking because they are the, the producers. Yeah? But we have to work closer together and understand what chemicals are being used and how the textiles are being produced. Zandro Paul? I'd just reinforce what Eric is saying. You know, we are taking our responsibility. We're taking the initiative today, the BMI programs. We're educating customers. We're introducing the new technologies, but that's not enough for just the chemical industry. We need you guys to engage as well in this partnership to reinforce the message why it's important to you and your, your customers that this technology, environmental friendly, uh, reducing water, why that's important if they want to continue to be your suppliers in the future. Yeah. Just yeah, probably make it more part of your uh, specifications. So making sure that you actually play your part in, in, uh, in the whole definition of, of this uh, supply chain improvement. Is there any response from anyone else? A challenge to everyone in the room? There's a show of hands. Who, I'm going to give you two choices. Who thinks actually there's a lot more the chemical industry should be doing? Is it going to be option one? Option two is who here sees it as the responsibility of the whole system? So everyone 
to sort this out. So who would like to see more from the um, chemical industry, not just the three colleagues here, but others, many others who are not in the room, who would like to see more action there? Who thinks it's the responsibility of everyone in the room? Okay, so that's most of you, not everybody, okay. Um, I've got another question. Yes, and, and John and then here, so John first. <laughs> yeah, I just want, this is to Peter really, could you, Blue Expert, could you just explain a bit more about the tool actually and, and what it actually is, what it does, how it fits into the rest of the Blue Science system and these three chemical uh, representatives of chemical companies here, how they, you know, how they, how they contribute to it and is it just these three chemical companies or would others be involved too? So John, the... We have workshops in the afternoon where we, uh, and I have an introduction to the workshop where I show the details so that you have, uh, but I can give you some ideas. Not only the processes are in, so all the, we have the link to the Blue Finder. So all the chemicals are in, so we are dealing with the clean chemistry, with uh, the best process from the, from the responsible chemical industry. So it's, so everything is together. But in details, we will see in the afternoon before we start the workshops. I'm just interested for colleagues on the stage, in terms of um, your competitors who are not here, people whose standards may not be as high as yours, what can be done about that? Well, we, we'd love to have more competitors Absolutely. joining if they respect the, the rules. Uh, again, if, if you produce dye stuffs and you don't um, treat the waste, you can have cost differences in the product up to $30 per kilo if you want to really trace some very complicated chemistry. So if you don't, you save $30 and you're much more competitive, right? So if, if you have more uh, dye stuff producers joining and they respect the rule that waste costs money and respect the nature, I will be happy. So join in. Join yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Again, Phil, I think it's... It's back to working as more of a partnership with the brands and retailers. Again, you know, we can deliver the messages that you know, uh, Blue Sign is the right way forward, but if the brands are also expressing how they value uh, the, the system, the information, and if they're not using it, then I should encourage them to start to use a Blue Sign. Yeah, okay. Great, there was another question here. Yes, please, thank you. Thank you. In uh, sharing the room with three experts like yourselves in the dye industry, um, we just wonder how promising and significant the future is for non-water dyeing. For instance, you've, we've heard of CO2 dyeing in the past and it consists of no water at all. Should manufacturers be looking at that or how promising and how, uh, how much should, should we look into investing in such a technology? Okay, great. Xander. Yeah, I think if you, if you look to those technologies and it's not only CO2, uh, but actually there's a whole array of technologies that reduce or even uh, uh, get to zero use of, of water. And I think uh, clearly from our perspective they're interesting. Uh, we work on all of them, uh, or most of them, uh, and they give spectacular results. Um, as an example, Acroma has a technology where um, you can uh, color denim uh, with 92% less water usage. Those are relevant, and particularly in a world where water becomes so scarce, I think we, we are all obliged to look at those technologies. And there is a technology which is uh, a technology, a company called Dyco. Uh, we've been working with them. Uh, they're sponsored by IKEA, by Nike and Adidas. And yeah, it's commercialized, but again, it's going to be a niche. Uh, it's not going to take over the dyeing industry. But at least we've got a commercialised technology there, which is based on the CO2. I think, I think yes, it's a very specific uh, segment uh, for polyester, but you have very simple, good technologies to dye without using uh, or using reduced water. Take, uh, for example, cold pad batch, take uh, low liquor ratio machines, uh, etc., etc. There are a lot of tools that are available. I think what we, we probably try in your sense is, it, is to give really a message to alert the, the retailers and the brands to, to go into their supply chains and, and check the supply chain really uh, thoroughly uh, to make sure that, that uh, 
uh, you know, the way the resources are being used is done properly. Yeah? Any other questions? Looking particularly if I asked you to think as a journalist, um, depending on which country you come from, you might be able to think of journalists who ask challenging questions. So what's the most challenging question we have in the room at the moment? It seems like everyone's in loud agreement. No, there's a hand at the back here, so if we could get the microphone. Or in silent agreement, possibly. So your challenge, please. Yeah, um, I'm fairly new to the whole blue sign, you know, the whole process here in it. And you are? Uh, oh, my name is Mark Davis. I work with Eagle Creek. Um, we do a lot of travel goods, uh, luggage, things like that. Um, it seems to me, and, and I, I would say we're probably a smaller company compared to maybe some of the big ones that are here. Um, it seems to me the end goal here is obviously to incorporate this technology across the board in every single product. Um, but ultimately, the biggest barrier to entry would be the cost of implementation, right? So I guess my question, and I, I don't know who might be the best to answer this, but what do you see as the uh, best method to reduce costs across the board, I mean, from the chemical side or from the brand side? How do we get it to the point where we can bring the cost down enough so that we can implement it across the board and really make a big impact globally. So it picks up what are people prepared to pay for might be the flip side of yeah. that as well. I think that's, that's one of the challenges as an industry where we've got to change a mindset. I mean, typically, if our commercial people go into a, a mill, they'll either meet the dye house manager or the procurement manager and their agenda is very different. It's based on, you know, optical price. And, and they would like to choose three potential suppliers so they can play the game, you know, based on price. And our message is clear. That business model will not support you in sustainability going forward. Now is the time to pick a partner and understand the full value proposition. And quite often you've got to get to the CEO or the owner who understands if like, the full value of, uh, proposition. So the optical price may be a little bit more expensive, but when you take your 50% water reduction, your 40, 50% energy reduction, less CO2, less wash times, so you get more productivity, zero capital, that's creating value. That's creating sustainability. So I think that's, that's the challenge, is changing people's mindsets in the industry, particularly the mills, that you want to, sustainability, you need a partner who's going to stand side by side with you. Is there another comment? Otherwise, I've got another question here. We're getting close to coffee. No, co co cost, uh, you know, when we talk about cost, I'm not sure what you have in mind. Just want to give you an example. Um, we, we produce what we call clean indigo. It's indigo solution, a liquid product, and, and you can take indigo uh, out of China. China is the, the biggest producer of indigo, the only producer of indigo powder today. Uh, the difference on a pair of jeans is probably five cents. So, you know, when, when you talk about cost, on the, on the jeans that cost, I don't know, $60, $80, $100, as you can see today in the shops, five cents for having a clean chemistry. Is that an issue? The question is not to us. The question is to those Companies, retailers, I have to repeat, who, who are selling the products, do you know about this? Do you know that there are alternatives? Do you know that there are clean chemistries and the costs are, are quite reasonable? My name is Kilian Hochren from Gore. According to our analysis, the situation that you mentioned, the cost effect on the final product is very similar um, to the environmental effect. So we can try to save a lot of water and energy and what have you in the process, which is valuable. But if we keep on reducing the life cycle of the finished product in use, we will less than compensate, or more than compensate, for the benefits generated in the beginning. So I would actually say we should become more expensive. So we need to create products that have higher value and higher lifespan. So what can we do as an industry um, to create value by moving less stuff and thus creating less um, wastes, 
less, using less energy and using less resources. Thank you. But all thrive together. So um, that, that, that'd be my So thinking my about what consumers want and a, a challenge maybe to... How can, how can we influence them? A challenge possibly to fast fashion. Um, colleague behind you, yeah, I think, very was good point. looking to speak as well. Just hearing the questions. Was there somebody behind? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, my name is Ralf Katanek. I'm also in the chemical uh, business. Yeah, I'm uh, the head of uh, textiles in CHT uh, Bissema Group. Uh, for me, uh, it's very important that we don't do a finger pointing to one of uh, the company in the chain. Yeah, so we have the whole textile chain here in the room. We have the brands here, we have the chemical industry here, yeah, and maybe also a textile producer. So, and I think we have to come much closer together, yeah, so to solve the problems uh, we are in. We have the chemistry, yeah, so Mr. Weber has uh, 5,000, 6,000 products in the blue finder, so the green chemistry is available. All the chemical companies have technical service to optimize the processes, to save costs and to save water, energy and so on. So now it's up to us to bring us together. We still have 250 different standards. Do we really need this? Can we work on one global textile standard? We have it in the automotive industry. Let us think in that direction whether we can work on one textile standard, which we can use. And we can avoid a lot of waste and can improve the, the, the sustainability of our textiles. Thank you. This is very important for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the, and Thank the you. plea for collaboration and how much you could achieve together. And David, thank you. Thanks. Uh, David Labaster, MEC Canada. Uh, just, we've been on the, the, the blue sign um, journey for a long time. And when we first started speaking to our mills, um, and this is just to, to speak to your question, um, it was definitely pushback against the cost of, of going through the blue sign screening. And everyone said it's going to cost a lot more. But what we found is as more and more mills come onto the blue sign standard and as more and more mills have discovered the efficiency gains is that we're getting um, a, a lot more blue sign fabrics, in fact majority blue sign fabrics, and the price difference is not material on a high quality product that you make. Um, certainly in fast fashion it may be, but in our business it's, it's, it's not material at all. And I can help you out with that later if you want. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Unless there's anything from anyone else. Um, I'm going to actually take the spirit, David, of your comment there of hope, actually, and ask each of our um, chief execs to say what gives you hope looking to the future. Well, hope is uh, this meeting, uh, and I hope it's a first step towards more meetings, more discussions in the industry, and at Dystar we have uh, also own initiatives to discuss with the retailers, and, and we'd love, we'd love to engage in, in discussions, and of course have the textile industry, uh, that is very important, to, to join these discussions. Uh, but if we don't move towards that, then we have to wait for the government to move. And that can take a lot of time. I think we shouldn't wait that long. Okay. Cool. I think uh, what gives me hope is if I look back just three, five years, and the lack of uh, collaboration, you know, we've, in 2011 we had uh, ZDHC, uh, which we all supported here on the chemical side. And I think that was a very positive step for the brands and retailers. And now we've got to go the next step and build on the uh, success of said DHC and further collaborate and understand why we need to collaborate. Well, you know, we've, we've come a long way so far, but now we really need to go forward together. Yeah, I think hope, uh, two things give hope. Uh, I think uh, a lot of increased awareness in countries that may not have been there in the past. Uh, also, awareness with the different nodes in the value chain. But I think also, uh, for me, what gives hope is the younger generation. Uh, I see a younger generation growing up that is much more aware of the world and about su sustainability, and I'm sure that they will impart uh, choices that we as companies have to make. So, um, yeah, clear hope. Thank you very much. Peter, is there anything from you? No, I have to pick up uh, Gunther Pauli's idea. So my message is we cannot wait other 20 years. So we have the solutions available. Please do something. Tremendous. With that challenge, um, thank you all very much. Thank you very much to our three chief executives. Thank you. Thank you.